In the quiet morning light of Henderson, Nevada, a town celebrated for its peace and security, 60-year-old Dwayne Keith Davis set out for what he thought would be another routine walk through familiar streets. But as the sun climbed higher, the day's calm was shattered by the approach of Las Vegas Metro Police. With a precision that betrayed countless rehearsals for this moment, they placed Davis in cuffs and announced his arrest for a crime that had become the stuff of legend. The unresolved murder of Tupac Shakur, a case as enigmatic as the lyrics of the rap icon himself. As Davis was escorted to a squad car, a flood of questions surged through the community and across the nation. Had justice finally caught up with the past or was this another twist in the long, winding saga that began on that fateful night in 1996? Join me today as we unravel the threads of this gripping tale, from the glittering heights of musical stardom to the darkened streets where shadows speak truths. Let's navigate the intricate maze of leads and of lies, the alliances and enmities that defines the era of thug life. And perhaps together we'll edge a little bit closer into answering the question that has lingered for decades. Who killed Tupac Shakur? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. Today, we're covering Tupac Shakur, written by Kevin, read by me. There was a recent development. Like, I have to say, first of all, my knowledge, like, I, I couldn't name. I mean, if someone told them to me, I'm sure I would know a Tupac song, but I couldn't name a single Tupac song right now if I was asked. If it was like, who wants to be a millionaire? And it was like, Simon, here at ABCD, which is the Tupac song. I'd be like, I don't know. And they'd be like, well, you don't win $100 then, do you? Um, because I feel, and people might be, I don't know, maybe Americans would be more surprised at this. And tell me, like, comments, let me know. Because I've got a few American friends who are about my age. And it seems like, you know, growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, and they have, like, knowledge of rap. Like, rap music was a part of their culture and stuff. And I don't, either it just wasn't in the, it wasn't part of my gro growing up, or it wasn't part of UK, like, culture in general, like it was US culture. Right? Is that just me? <laughs> I don't know, but I know nothing. And they're like, like, they would definitely know all about Tupac and about other rappers who I just don't, have no idea about. Anyway, not interesting. You're not here for this. You're here for murder, aren't you, folks? Let's just jump in, shall we? Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to take a moment to shout out today's fantastic sponsor, which has been keeping my feet dry all autumn so far and keeping them warm going into winter, and that is one of my favorite sponsors. It's Vessi. Look, Vessi have something called Dymatex technology, which makes these shoes waterproof. That's not water resistant. It's not like, oh yeah, they'll... They'll keep the water out for a little bit. No, 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 they are waterproof. You could put these in a river, dip them up to here, and it's like you're wearing rain shoes or Wellington boots, as we call them in the UK. Normally, I like to keep the ones I show you on screen nice and fresh and clean and like fresh out of the box. But I just went to Iceland a couple of weekends ago and I needed a pair of really warm shoes to send with, take with me. And Bessie just sent me these with their extra grippy bottoms. They've got this fleece lined interior. This kept my feet warm and dry all weekend. They have got you covered for whatever you're up to this winter. They're also incredibly lightweight. There's loads of stars to choose from. This is the Soho sleek sophisticated ready for any weather plus they've also got the overcast jacket they've got waterproof gloves that's just stretchily insulated and touchscreen compatible perfect for those chilly days ahead so if you're gearing up for the ultimate black friday cyber monday shopping spree dive into their biggest sale of the year head to vessi.com forward slash tcc vessi isn't just a shoe it's a lifestyle so step into the holidays with style savings and most importantly dry feet check out the link below thank you to vessi for sponsoring Grab your pair now at vessi.com forward slash TCC for 15% off your first order. And now back to today's video. September the 29th, 2023 started off as an ordinary day for 60-year-old Dwayne Keith Davis. He had gone out for his typical morning stroll in his Henderson, Nevada neighborhood. This would normally be an uneventful walk, as Henderson routinely ranks in the top three safest large cities in the United States. It's certainly not something that would typically result in police rolling up, but that's exactly what happened that morning. I was just reading an article. It was in Time Out magazine. I mean, I wasn't reading Time Out. I got linked to Time Out. I don't read Time Out. Should I read Time Out? What's Time Out? It's a magazine, right, about like culture and stuff. <laughs> I'm just not that cultural. But my neighborhood was ranked by Time Out as like the 29th coolest neighborhood to live in in the world. And I was like 28th or something. Vina Hradi. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Look at that. It is nice. It's a great neighborhood. I'm leaving it soon because I'm moving to a different neighborhood, which is like Vina Hradi's great, but it's not the most family friendly place in the world. So I'm moving to a slightly, you know, more green neighborhoods where it's a little bit more family friendly. You have got a garden and sh 
because I don't know, kids and gardens. It's like the most amazing thing. Like when I go to my parents' house or my wife's parents' house and they have a garden and it's like, you're just like, kids go in the garden and they're like, okay, dad. And they're just running around for ages and you're like, ah. Oh. Whereas like, I don't know, like right now I live in an apartment or a flat and it's like, yeah, kids run around and they're like, dad, dad, show me this. And I'm just like, oh, I wish we had a garden. I could do that final hands-off parenting that I dream of. Las Vegas Metro Police parked their car and asked for Dwayne to come over to them. He obliged the officers and was promptly put into cuffs and guided into the vehicle for transport. They didn't even need to say why he was under arrest because he already knew. In his own words, they were bringing him in for the biggest case in Las Vegas history, September the 7th, 1996. Dwayne Davis was being arrested for the murder of Tupac Shakur. Wait, this was 1996. Okay, and we know like the that he it's kind of unsolved, right, until recently. When they arrested someone like as a suspect, right? I saw that in the headlines. It's probably why Kevin pitched this episode. <laughs> he was like, yeah, this is in the news. And now we're like weeks behind because of production schedules. When the news broke, one of three different questions likely jumped to your mind, depending on your perspective and knowledge of the story. For some people, the first question they asked was, how can somebody be arrested for the murder of a person who's still alive? We're not actually going to get into that conspiracy because it wasn't meant to be taken seriously. It had become a sort of running joke that Tupac really couldn't have been killed because he continued to release album after album of new material for the decade following his murder. And that joke got misinterpreted as a genuine theory by people who didn't understand that Tupac may have been the single hardest working person in the industry. While the volume was impressive, it's hardly unprecedented for a person's work to release after their death. Hell, if Simon were to suddenly disappear, there would still be months of new videos across all of his channels. Yes, there would. There's an extraordinary amount of content that is pre-recorded. Like, I, there's got to be a hundred hours. There's probably a hundred hours just sitting in various Dropbox folders just waiting to be produced. So if I die, it'd be like, you guys are good for a few months, but then it will all stop. Sorry. <laughs> The second question a lot of people asked was, who the hell is Dwayne Davis? He's not the sort of household name that most of the people in today's episode are, but he's still rather infamous. Dwayne, better known as Keefe D, was a well-known drug dealer, a member of the Southside Compton Crips. He was also a childhood friend of both Easy E from NWA and Suge Knight, pronounced like the first syllable of sugar. Yeah, I know that. I'd like, I don't know who Suge Knight is, but I know how to pronounce his name for some reason. It's unclear to what extent Tupac and Keefe might have known one another, but they certainly knew a lot of the same people. And that just brings us to the final question that people have been asking about the arrest. Why now? And why not 20 years ago? Oh wait, is this now? Okay, so 60 years- Oh, sorry, I'm so stupid. It's 2023. We're leading- We're starting with the lead. Why can't I pay attention to my own videos? It's crazy. Keefe's involvement in the murder of Tupac has been considered a bit of an open secret, like the crimes of Jimmy Savile or Harvey Weinstein. But it doesn't matter how many people know the secret if nobody close enough to the suspect is willing to talk. When given the opportunity, even Tupac refused to name his killer. Yeah, it's like you have these open secrets, right? And it's like, I have nothing to do with the world of celebrity. Like, I spent- like, I mean, maybe like now it's like F-list celebrity whistle. But back in the day, it's like even like the Russell Brand thing. Even I knew that something was cooking there like years ago because I was just at a mate's party and a friend of mine there was just, or like a friend of my mates was there and we were just like having a chat after a few beers. And oh God, I can't even remember if it was a man or a woman was just saying like, yeah, no, I was working with Russell Brands and they were like, the sh that is gonna come out. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Like, okay. And then it's like, I'm just sitting like waiting around, racing around. And then you see those headlines and it's like Russell Brand accused by multiple women. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm not surprised. Not surprised at all. Because if I know, if I know, and I have nothing to do with this world, then everyone knows. And it's like the same with Kevin Spacey being uh, gay and a bit weird. Because another mate of mine was like, yeah, I was on holiday in, in Ibiza or somewhere. I was getting hit on by Kevin Spacey. I'm like, holy sh**, really? <laughs> No, it wasn't the person. It was like their mate. And it's like, I'm so far removed from this. But the fact that you kind of like, oh yeah, okay. When it comes out, you're like, yeah, yeah. So it's like these open secrets. It's wild. And it's just so many people know, but then nothing ever happens until much later. Sergeant Chris Carroll was the first officer on the scene following the shooting of Tupac. According to Carroll, at first Tupac was non-cooperative. The sergeant was asking Tupac who shot him, attempting to get a dying declaration that could be used in court, but Tupac was struggling to speak. Suddenly, he became calm as if it made his peace. Carroll again asked him who shot him, and this time Tupac looked directly at the officer, breathed in, and with all the emphasis he could muster, he spoke his famous last words. F you. Wow. That is gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that. What were your last words? F you. The Panther 21.
1969, a coordinated attack was carried out by the Black Panthers in New York City. Okay, <laughs> back we go. The targets were two police stations and the Queen's Board of Education office. Undercover police officers who had infiltrated the Panthers were able to sabotage two of the bombs, but one still went off, blowing a hole in the side of the education office building. Fortunately, there were no fatalities, and I'm fairly certain, but not 100% sure, that there weren't even any injuries. Following the attack, 21 members of the Black Panthers, aptly known as the Panther 21, were arrested and charged with the crimes. Among those arrested was Afini Shakur, who found herself facing over 150 charges and saddled with a $100,000 bail. Holy sh! That's over $800,000 today. She spent about two years in prison leading up to the trial, although she was one of the first two that the Panthers bailed out in the hopes that she could help raise money to pay bail for the others. The trial began in 1971 and would last for eight months. Unable to afford an attorney, Afini chose to represent herself. Um... If you're unable to afford an attorney, an attorney will be provided for you, and you should take that attorney, even if they're not brilliant, because you know what they are? They're better than you, because you didn't go to law school. At least they went to law school. <laughs> At least they know something. They've got some experience. You're just like, nah, mate, I'm not guilty. <laughs> no, no. She later admitted that she made this decision rather than going with a public defender because she was young and arrogant, adding that, I thought this was the last time I could speak before they locked me up forever. I was writing my own obituary. Um, someone needs to explain, like, they're just being like, you should at least talk to a lawyer before, like, rejecting them. You should at least ask them this question. Look, just always, always, I'm saying this in casual career, even if you're innocent, always get a lawyer. The police, that they will twist your words if they think you're guilty. Get a lawyer, even if you're innocent. Always. Not only was she wrong about being locked up forever, but her efforts played a crucial role in all 21 Panthers being acquitted on all charges. <laughs> well, Gavin, make me look stupid, why don't you? Never mind. Forget it all. Represent yourself. You don't need a lawyer. You see, the police and the feds have a lot of leeway when it comes to committing crimes thanks to qualified immunity. If a cop is going to go undercover in a criminal enterprise, it's pretty much expected that they'll be required to commit crimes on the regular in order to avoid detection. However, this is not without its limits. The criminal activity is supposed to be justified and minimized, but those are subjective terms that arguably do little to curb their behavior. The real key is that they're not supposed to be the ones organizing the crimes. They can take part in other people's crimes, but they're not supposed to initiate and orchestrate any plans. Needless to say that when Afini got Officer Ralph White to admit during cross-examination that he and two other undercover cops had personally organized almost all of the illegal activities, it was a massive bombshell. What the f*** are you doing, Ralph White? I understand. I don't, I don't think it's right or moral, obviously not. But it's like, yo, if you're Ralph White and you're going in with the Colombian cartels and they're like, yo, Ralph, Ralph, here's a, here's a million in like cash in like pesetas or whatever Columbia uses. And Ralph's like, eh, eh, and he tucks it under his mattress. I'll be like, I get it, I get it, but wh wh why Ralph? You're just like bombing places. Why are you becoming it? Why are you like being all terroristy? There was no way the police could legally justify this level of involvement from the officers, especially since the group they infiltrated wasn't a criminal enterprise in the first place. While many people viewed the Black Panthers as being far too militant and confrontational for their own good, and Hoover's FBI definitely had some real issues with them to say the least, the Panthers have never been categorized as a criminal or domestic terrorist organization. Wait, so they were just like a regular organization, and then when they bombed somewhere, it turned out it was the undercover police who were trying to expose them that were doing the bombing. Are you shitting me? They were activists seeking social reform, particularly involved in fighting police brutality and trying to improve the quality of education for black youths. I get that being constantly monitored by Panthers who were openly carrying their legal firearms could make the police uncomfortable, which was kind of the point, but the solution wasn't to send undercover agents to the Harlem Panthers office with fake dynamite and say, Hey, what about the police stations with us? Yeah, that's not okay. That's not okay. Isn't that like entrapment or whatever they call it? Not only did Afini get Ralph to admit that the police had organized most of the illegal activities, she also got him to admit that he misrepresented the Panthers to his bosses, that he betrayed the community, and that he found the activism they'd done together to be powerfully inspiring and beautiful. She did all of this despite having no legal training and being pregnant for the entire eight months trial. <laughs> Oh my god, I take it all back, Afini. You need to go to law school, get a law degree, and become a lawyer, because apparently you're just naturally incredible at it. On June the 16th, 1971, one month after being acquitted, Afini gave birth to her son, Lasanne Parish Crooks. A year later, she decided that she didn't like their name, so she changed the name to Tupac Amaru Shakur, named after the Peruvian revolutionary Tupac Amaru II. 
the second <laughs> two pack of RE2. What's wrong with you? The second. The father was a fellow Black Panther, Billy Garland, which was problematic since Afini was married to Lumumba Shakur. The marriage quickly dissolved, leaving Afini a single mother. Billy was mostly off doing Black Panther stuff, and while his and Tupac's paths did a very occasionally cross, it wasn't until Tupac was a teenager that he found out that Billy was his biological father. In 1975, Afini married Matulu Shakur, the cousin of her first husband. Matulu was a member of the Black Liberation Army, and he wound up on the run after some cops got killed in an armored truck heist in 1981. So while Tupac did have a stepfather for a few of his formative years, it was largely Afini raising him on her own. Following her acquittal, Afini got a job working as a paralegal to provide Tupac and his siblings with the best life that she could. Good, this is the right path for you. Like, if you can't afford to go to law school or can't go to law school for whatever reason, taking a job as a paralegal, that sounds like a really good position for you. Because the lawyers will be like, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> Please, <laughs> just do our lawyering. <laughs> This worked for about a decade, but things went south in a big way in the 1980s, not just for Afini, but for much of America. There was a hot new commodity on the market that people couldn't get enough of, and it was called crack cocaine. In those early days, the danger of crack wasn't fully understood by most people. The active ingredient is still just cocaine, so crack was seen as a cheaper, smokable version of the drug that already existed. Yeah, you'd kind of think, like, I don't know, if someone was, if someone, if I knew nothing about crack and cocaine, and someone was like, yo, there's this white powder that you shove up your nose, or there's this one that you smoke, which one is less dangerous? I'll be like, the smoky smoky, because smoking's fine. Since it wasn't known just how much more dangerous and addictive crack was than powdered cocaine, people would deal crack to their own families the same way that they'd deal weed. It's reported that Afini was a recreational user of cocaine, having first snorted it at the age of 15, but the stress of being a single mother who was being hassled by the FBI for her Black Panther associations led her to try out the cheaper and more plentiful alternative to powdered cocaine. Once she became a crack addict, Afini was unable to hold down a job. She was still trying her best to nurture Tupac's intellect and creativity, and when he was 12 years old, Afini enrolled Tupac in the 127th Street Ensemble, a Harlem theater group. He performed with them at the famous Apollo Theater in their production of A Raisin in the Sun. Tupac was the only child in the cast. It was undoubtedly a highlight among what was otherwise a hard times. In an attempt to escape her addiction, Afini moved the family to Baltimore, Maryland in 1984. It didn't work, and she raised her children on welfare due to her inability to keep a job. At the age of 13, Tupac attended 8th grade at Roland Park Middle School. His strange name, lack of trendy clothes, and overall appearance made him unpopular with the other students. The next year, he attended a regular public school for his freshman year of high school, but for his sophomore year, he auditioned for and was accepted to the Baltimore School for the Arts. This was still part of the public school system, so there was no private school tuition fees for him to worry about, and it was a much better fit for Tupac. Not only was he more popular at this school, but it gave him the opportunity to study things like acting, poetry, jazz, and ballet. Yes, Tupac danced ballet as the Mouse King in the school production of The Nutcracker. It was also at this school where Tupac would meet his lifelong friend, Jada Pinkett. However, there was something that Tupac's teachers noticed about him that would eventually become a source of some controversy. Most people aren't hollow two-dimensional characters, and Tupac had two very distinct sides to himself. On the one hand, he was an extremely bright student with a hunger for knowledge. He loved to read and consume information to the point that teachers even remembered him reading entire sets of encyclopedias. But on the other end of the spectrum, Tupac hid his love of learning and acted like a tough guy with the other students as a way to gain their respect. And when I say he acted tough, I'm not trying to get into the whole fake thug or studio gangster debate surrounding Tupac. A debate I'm entirely unfamiliar with. Although I like the term studio gangster. It's kind of like, um, it reminds me of that term like keyboard warriors and stuff. People are all big and hard behind their keyboards. And then in real life, they're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was a dick. It's just that this was the first point in his life where we see a real, clear distinction between how he was in private and how he portrayed himself publicly. Everybody does this to some extent, so it's kind of whatever, but the aforementioned debate remains a controversial topic. While living in Baltimore, Tupac wrote his first rap under the name MC New York. The song was about gun control and it was inspired by the shooting death of one of his close friends. Of course, 1980s Baltimore wasn't really known for its rap scene, so Tupac's career wasn't about to take off yet. In 1988, just four years after moving to Maryland, before Tupac had a chance to finish high school, it was time for the Shakur family to move yet again. This time, it was the housing projects in Marin City, California, near San Francisco. Tupac attended high school at first and took part in the theater program there, but he wound up dropping out before graduation. Afini was still in the throes of addiction at this point and unable to keep a job, so Tupac had to find a way to make money. He briefly tried selling drugs, but friends say this only lasted about a week. Tupac would see things like people trying to trade their wedding rings for crack, and he simply didn't have it in him to destroy people's lives like that, deciding he'd rather starve than deal. He was instead 
determined to make it as a rapper, and he formed a group called Strictly Dope with Ray Love and DJ Dees, still rapping under the name MC New York at the time. It was the right call, because in 1989, a year after moving to California, Tupac was going to begin his rise. I, I, I assumed like he had another name. I thought like Tupac was like his like MC New York name, his his stage name or whatever, and he had a different name. Because almost everyone seems to him. And you look them up on like Wikipedia or whatever, and it would be like, Tupac, original name, John Smith, <laughs> or something like that, right? Ascent to Stardom While out dancing one night, Tupac met Leela Steinberg, and the two hit it off. She invited him to a poetry workshop she was hosting the next day, and she saw a lot of promise in his work. Leela became Tupac's first manager, and as she learned more about his home life, she realized it was too dysfunctional of an environment for him to stay in while trying to build a career. A few months after they met, she offered for him and Ray to come and live in her apartment with her, her husband, and her kids. Holy sh**, Leela's a good manager. She's like, hey, you seem good at this stuff. Come live with my family. Okay. According to Leela, Tupac saw her as the perfect package to get him where he needed to go. He wasn't wrong, as not only had she given him a much more stable living environment full of new books on philosophy, religion, and cultural issues for him to absorb, but Leela was also working to get him a contract. Of course, as fondly as she remembers the time she spent with Tupac in her home, he wasn't the perfect guest. Leela described him as being one of the sloppiest and dirtiest people she'd ever met, the sort of guy that would rather just buy new clothes than do laundry. <laughs> Yeah, I get it, though. I mean, fair. <laughs> I get it. There were also frequent visits by the police, though these could take a humorous turn. On one occasion, Leela recounted the police knocking on her door for yet another noise complaint over the volume of Tupac's music. She apologized, said they'd turn it down because she didn't want any problems, but then Tupac appeared over her shoulder, sarcastically saying, The neighbor's rock music is just as loud. You don't give them sh**. He then told the officer to stare at the door while he turned the music down to ensure it was lowered to an acceptable level. Tupac ran to the stereo, put on NWA's police just loud enough for the officer to hear but not so loud that it would justify another noise complaint asking him is this good officer <laughs> because malicious compliance is the best form of compliance i also really hope you enjoyed that little anecdote because that's the last time there's going to be anything funny about tupac's run-ins with the police oh god kevin no <laughs> savage turn for months, Leela mentored Tupac, encouraging him in his reading and writing, but she recognized that to make it big, he was going to need a real manager, for lack of a better term. Wait, Leela sounds like an amazing manager. What? No, Leela, you could do it. She reached out to Antron Gregory, the manager of the Oakland-based rap group Digital Underground, to try and get Tupac a deal. Antron said he needed a video of Tupac performing, so Strictly Dope put on their first concert on the lawn of Leela's apartment building, inviting all the kids from the building to show up and fill out the crowd for the camera. In 1990, Antron signed Tupac and had him work as a roadie, backup dancer, and backup rapper for Digital Underground. At the urging of Leela, Digital Underground's chop master Jay worked with Strictly Dope to produce their earlier studio recordings. It was clear at the start that there was something different different about Tupac, especially in the recording studio. Chop Master J said that Tupac didn't work well with others because he was strictly business. A lot of guys like to drink, smoke, and have fun during their recording sessions, but Tupac didn't have time for any of that nonsense while he was in the studio. As far as he was concerned, they could party afterwards, but now was the time for work. I like that. Yes, I have maybe two or three meetings a month. I really try to keep meetings as absolutely non-existent as possible. And I don't meet people for lunch. I don't do all of this because I'm at work to work. The amount of waste that I see from like friends in companies and stuff where they're just like, well, we had a meeting about that. We had a meeting about that. Then we had to travel here and travel to do that. I'm like, when do you actually do work? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe like <laughs> after that meeting, I did a little bit. It's like, but then I had to go to another meeting. It's like, what are you doing? It's so inefficient. Don't you just want to get something done? Digital Underground's Shock G made similar remarks about the first time he met Tupac just after Atron signed him. Tupac walked into the studio, introduced himself, and immediately started asking, So, you want me to rhyme now, never breaking eye contact? According to Shock G, Dude was intense. He also described Tupac as being better than average in the early days, but added that he wasn't going to blow people away yet. Still, it was clear there was promise. This was still years before Thug Life, and at the time, Tupac's songs only took two different forms. I've heard of Thug Life, not sure if that's an album or a song, but like I said, if someone named them, I would probably be familiar with them, but I don't know what it goes like. Either they were just kind of silly fun songs like The Case of the Misplaced Mic, in which he goes on an adventure to find his microphone that disappeared, or they were filled with political and socioeconomic commentary. Oh, and if you were wondering, the mic was actually in his pocket the whole time. I wasn't Kevin, but I'm so glad we got a resolution to that story. I was happy as hell because I was lucky that night. I put my hand in my pocket and there was my mic. He wasn't the only person rapping about social issues and inequality, but there was something that separated him from the 
the rest. Not only was he educated and well-read despite having dropped out of high school, but the number one word used by Tupac's friends and contemporaries to describe him was articulate. I wish they'd chosen a different word, since I now know how it sounds when someone like me or Simon says he's so well-spoken, but it is what it is. Wait, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand. What's wrong with he's so well-spoken? He speaks so well. He's so well-spoken. There may have been some other people rapping about the same sorts of topics, but Tupac was able to express those ideas more eloquently and in a way that more deeply resonated with people. Based on this, so far you might assume that he was a perfectionist in the studio, but according to Shock G, it was the opposite. Instead of obsessing over every word, he would just write something down, and if he didn't think it was good, he'd throw it away and write a new song instead of trying to revise it. While many artists can spend weeks in the studio on each song making sure it was perfect, Tupac could record multiple tracks each day. It was this no-nonsense attitude in the studio that allowed him to record so much material that he released more new albums after he died than when he was still alive. Anyway, as Digital Underground got to know Tupac better, they did more to put him on the mic. In January 1991, he dropped the stage in AMC New York and started rapping as Tupac. Ah, like two, the number two, P-A-C. Okay, that sounds like that's probably where I think, like, that's where he gets his, like, you know, rapper name from. That month, Digital Underground released their single, Same Song, which is considered Tupac's recording debut. The song was featured on the soundtrack of the Dan Aykroyd film, Nothing But Trouble. This is the first big win for Tupac's career, but by no means the last. Having been interested not only in music but acting, Tupac auditioned for the movie Juice. He was cast as Bishop, one of the main characters in the movie, and when the movie released the following year, it was well received by critics and audiences alike. The breakout performance opened a lot of doors in the film industry, though his future behavior would later close a number of those doors. As a fun little aside, Tupac met Samuel L. Jackson while working on Juice, as he also had a role in the film. They didn't become great friends or anything, and Jackson's wife even yelled at Tupac on set for swearing in front of women. However, because the two had met, a friend of Tupac claims that George Lucas reached out to Jackson, asking him to get Tupac to audition for the role of Mace Windu in The Phantom Menace. It was allegedly one of three roles he auditioned for before his death. Tupac also recorded his first solo album that year, Tupacalypse Now, which released in November. But a month before the album's release, he had a run-in with the Oakland Police Department and allegedly with police brutality. Tupac was walking down the street when he was stopped by two officers for jaywalking, of all things. I've been stopped for jaywalking in America. <laughs> it's just like crossing the street. Because you can just cross wherever you like in Europe. It's normal. And I'm just like crossing the street and an officer's like, hey! And I'm like, yes? And he's like, you have to cross at the crossing! And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they asked for his ID, and they allegedly started giving him sh** either because they didn't believe Tupac was his real name, or they didn't think it was an American name, which suggests they might have thought he was in the country illegally. Ah, yes. According to Tupac's accounts of events, he told the police, f**k y'all, for hassling him about his name. He then recounted, next thing I know, is in a chokehold, passing out with cuffs on, headed to jail for resisting arrest. He filed a $10 million lawsuit against the Oakland PD. If he won, he'd planned to use the money to buy himself a house in California, buy a house for his mother who had finally overcome her drug addiction and moved back to New York, and use the rest to build things like a boy's home and a stop police brutality center. The case never went to trial, so the presence of police brutality and the extent to which it may have existed are entirely allegations but the department did settle the lawsuit for $43,000, which is a lot more money today. It's got to be, what, like 100 grand a day? Easy. We always talk about how everybody settles because it's cheaper, easier, and avoids emissions of guilt, but it's worth noting that the settlements for claims of police brutality were a lot rarer back in 1991, especially because brutality cases rarely received any media attention. Then again, this is the same year that the Rodney King beating occurred in Los Angeles, and I'll let you interpret the police department's decision to settle this case however you like. I just figured I'd give it as much context as possible. They wanted to go away because they're like, oh no, look at how brutal we are. He's going to come to light again. It doesn't look good for us. Better solution would be just like, don't be brutal. Just don't be brutal. It's not that hard, is it? A month after this incident, Tupac's next album dropped and sold half a million copies, and his second album, released in February of 1993, was another critical and commercial success. The second album, Strictly For My N-I-G-G-A-Z, still focused on political and social issues, but was regarded as being more hardcore than his previous work. The song Last Words featured both Ice Cube and Ice-T, most famous for F*** The Police and Cop Killer respectively. Or if you're like 70, most famous for the kids' movie Are We There Yet and for Law & Order SVU respectively. Things have been going great for Tupac, and he seemed unstoppable. That same year, he returned to the big screen alongside Janet Jackson in the film Poetic Justice. The movie only did okay and was met with mixed reviews, but the complaints were all about the writing, whereas critics loved Jackson and Tupac's performances. But 1993 also saw a lot of changes in Tupac's life, and things just started to spiral out of control. I just watched a terribly 
terribly written show. But it was, um, what the f*** was it called? It's about a plane that gets hijacked. The show's called Hijack. It is the worst written show that I've ever, what, I can't believe I actually finished it. It's dreadfully written. And um, the main dude, played by Idris Elba, it's like, <laughs> who's a good actor? And it's like, this is what you had to deal with. <laughs> it's so bad. Thug life and legal troubles. It's said that it was on the set of Poetic Justice where Tupac first met Christopher Wallace, aka Biggie Smalls, aka the Notorious B.I.G. They were, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. You look up Notorious B.I.G. and it's like, born Christopher Wallace. <laughs> they quickly became good friends with Tupac, visiting Biggie whenever he was in New York and Biggie crashing on Tupac's couch whenever he was in L.A. Tupac would also, did he really crash on Tupac's couch when he was in L.A.? Tupac just sold half a million records. He's probably crashing in, like, Tupac's pool house, right? Tupac would invite Biggie up on stage with him when he performed and recorded the song Running From The Police Together. The track, which took two years to release due to various controversies, was later renamed to just Runnin'. At this point, Tupac was already famous, while Biggie was just starting to come up. He was signed to Puff Daddy's newly created Bad Boy Records, but he had concerns about the future of the label and wanted the success Tupac had, so he asked Tupac to be his manager. He declined and told Biggie to stay with Bad Boy, saying Puffy would make him a star. Tupac was absolutely correct about that, and the two remained friends for the time being. Tupac even invited Biggie to join the group Thug Life for an album that he was working on with Big Sky, his stepbrother Moprim Shakur, Maka Doshis, and The Rated R. The name was originally conceived as an anagram standing for The Hate You Give Little Infants Fucks Everybody. Hm. It's like one of the rules of the casual criminals, isn't it? Don't fuck up your kids. They had this as well. I like that. The work was meant to show the negative effects systemic racism has on society, showing how a cycle of hatred and marginalization was directly responsible for the creation of generations of so-called thugs that terrorized the same society that created them. Messages about social reform, racial equality are great and all. But like I said earlier, people are multifaceted, and sometimes smart people say really stupid things. And it was around this time that Tupac made a particularly stupid comment regarding race during an interview with The Source magazine. With regards to famed record producer Quincy Jones, Tupac said all he does is stick his d in white bitches and make fucked up kids. Okay, I have no idea who Quincy Jones is, so I don't know the context. He was the first person to call out Jones and his interracial marriages, but bringing his kids into it was not cool. Um, okay. <laughs> don't know what to say about that. Quincy's 17-year-old daughter, Rashida Jones, did not care for these statements. <laughs> Yeah, because he called her a fucked up kid. What a surprise. She wrote a scathing reply to Tupac that was published in a later issue of Source magazine in which she said that if it wasn't like people for her father paving the way, Tupac wouldn't even have a platform to run his mouth on like an arsehole. This exchange is going to come up again later, but it was hardly the worst trouble that Tupac found himself in that year. In the early morning hours of October the 31st, Tupac's caravan of cars was returning to his hotel after performing at the Clark Atlanta University when they stumbled upon an altercation. There are varying accounts of what happened, so exactly how the story played out is uncertain. What we can say for sure is that everything began when brothers as Mark and Scott Whitwell, along with their wives, left a bar that night. They had been celebrating Scott's wife passing the bar exam and were ready to call it a night. As they were crossing the street, a driver nearly hit them. That's when the story starts to diverge, so I'll give you what I and apparently the prosecutors believe to be the most credible story of allegedly what happened following the narrowly avoided car accident. Tupac's caravan showed up, with him riding in the lead car. There was also a car in front of them blocking the road, with the black driver being assaulted by Mark and Scott, two white men who were allegedly throwing both fists and racial slurs. He immediately jumped out of the car to come to the aid of the driver, and his entourage followed suit. Mark pulled a gun and pointed it at Tupac and his crew, so Tupac pulled out his Glock in what he believed to be self-defense. Holy sh**! He fired three times, hitting Mark in the abdomen and Scott in the butt. That's allegedly how it went down, and the brothers were treated at the hospital and released the next day, while Tupac was arrested for aggravated assault and released on $55,000 bail. Um, yo, if someone pulls a gun on you, and you happen to have a gun, and you pull the gun on them and shoot them, what is that if not self-defense? Someone pulled a gun on you. From that point, like, if you pull a gun on someone, and they pull a gun on you and shoot you, I'm sorry, but that's on you. Don't pull guns on people, are you insane? However, things got a bit more complicated. It turned out that Mark and Scott were off-duty police officers in plain clothes, something that it's unclear whether or not they mentioned at the time this all was happening. Shooting cops is probably the worst thing you could do if you want to stay out of prison, and yet the charges were dropped entirely. I'm sorry, but like Mark and Scott, you should know better. What are you doing taking out your guns? 
You're police officers. You should know better. There were a few key factors that led to the charges being dismissed. I mean, it doesn't seem that surprising. Like, so, two off-duty police officers, I'm assuming pretty fucking drunk, are like almost hit by a car. They get into an altercation. Someone comes to the person who they're altercating's defense. And then one of the them pulls a gun on the dude and gets shot. I'm sorry, but it's like, that's not going to trial. <laughs> like, what the f***? Mark and Scott were both drunk. Yes, what a surprise. And the evidence showed they lied about who the aggressor in the exchange was. By themselves, neither of those things would likely be enough to get the case dismissed before even going to a grand jury. However, the brothers were also carrying guns that Scott admitted to have stolen from a police evidence locker. Bruh. What are you doing? You're a cop, bro. Prison is not going to be fun. Like, stealing guns as a police officer, you're going to go to prison. And people are going to be like, so what do you do on the outside? Well, listen, boys, a lot of live, la, 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 la. I'm not a cop. Then it's like, oh, yeah, I know you. You're the reason I'm here. Let's get the shank. If I was a police officer, I'd be like so careful not to even accidentally commit crime because you know prison's going to be bad. Tupac avoided criminal charges, but the brothers both filed civil lawsuits afterwards. It was a close call, but it still wasn't the worst of Tupac's legal troubles. That came the following month when he was accused of sexual assault by his acquaintance, Ayana Jackson. He had first met Ayana at a Manhattan nightclub, where she allegedly performed oral sex on him on the dance floor, though she has since claimed that that part never happened. Either way, that night, she went back to Tupac's room, where they talked and eventually had sex. After that, Tupac's road manager, Charles Fuller, would frequently set up meetings with Ayana whenever they were in Manhattan. She claimed they hung out together on those occasions and just talked but did not have sex that allegedly changed one night when she was invited to his hotel suite where tupac charles drug dealer and music executive jack agnant better known as haitian jack and an unidentified fourth person were all hanging out tupac and ayana talked for a little bit before going back to one of the bedrooms ayana gave him a massage which turned into kissing but while that was happening the other two men entered the room ayana alleged that all four men sexually assaulted her though years later she claimed that charles had not Tupac was later charged with three counts of sodomy, two counts of first-degree sexual abuse, and two counts of illegal possession of a firearm for guns that were found in the hotel room but were not part of the alleged assault. I mean, unlike the last time, I'm kind of like, okay, <laughs> this doesn't look good for you, Tupac, does it? It was going to cost a lot in legal fees to defend the allegations, which was a huge drain on Tupac's finances. Yeah, lawyers are so expensive. I have, like, lawyers who deal with, like, some of my, you know, more boring side of my business. And it's like, any time, it's like, oh, why? So much money. So much money. Thunk Life's only album didn't release until September of 1994, and the group usually performed live without him. Tupac's next solo album also wasn't going to release until 1995, so there wasn't a huge stream of income. He was still performing, and he appeared in the 1994 film Above the Rim, but he didn't have a major tour or an album release and had been fired from the movie Higher Learning following his arrest. Somewhat ironically, for reasons that will soon become apparent, many believe that the character Tupac played in Above the Rim was modeled after Haitian Jack, who was also charged with Iana's assault. Biggie had reportedly told Tupac to stay away from Jack, but he hadn't listened. Anyway, between the diminished income, relatively lavish spending, and legal fees, money was starting to get scarce for Tupac. Yeah, you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta watch your money, because otherwise it'll disappear. For me, I'm always like, I gotta, you gotta be ready to cut back. Like if money stops coming in, you gotta you gotta cut that. You can't spend money on all the crazy shit that you used to buy. While all this was happening, there was war going on. At least that was the public image. There was a feud between East Coast and West Coast rappers that was portrayed as being a huge deal within the industry. In the beginning, at least, I think for the most part, it was just work. They hated each other the same way The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin hated each other. I have no idea what that reference is. <laughs> I assume it's like they pretend to hate each other because it's good for you know. It's like a, a beef, like an internet beef. Everyone's getting views on an internet beef. I'm working on my internet beefs. <laughs> the public feud was good for headlines and likely boosted sales for all parties involved, but many believe it was intended to be harmless until it wasn't. On 30th of November, Tupac was in Manhattan to record verses for a song. He got a page from music manager and drug dealer Jimmy Henchman, who had met through Haitian Jack. Jimmy wanted him to come down to Quad Studios that night to record a verse for a new client of his. Tupac wasn't really sure about the whole thing, but he was being offered $7,000 that he really needed to help pay his legal bills. <laughs> $7,000 is not going to pay your lawyers for very long. <laughs> Funnily enough, just popped up on my screen. Got an email from my lawyer. It's all good. I'm sure you're working on something. Money, money, money! Against his better judgment, he and his longtime friend Stretch from Digital Underground and two others went down to Quad Studios that night. 
When they arrived, they heard familiar voices cheerfully shouting down to them for a few stories up. It was Biggie and Junior MAFIA, the group Biggie had formed with Bad Boy Records rather than joining Thug Life. Tupac, Stretch, and the others entered Quad Studios, but when they entered the lobby, they were greeted by three men with guns waiting to rob them. The others got to the floor, but Tupac tried to grab the gun from one of the assailants and was shot five times in the struggle. He was then robbed of $40,000 in cash and jewelry. Bro, if you're going to do something for seven thousand dollars to help pay your legal bills what you're doing carrying around forty thousand dollars worth of cash and jewelry there should be like some things like you know net worth divided by a certain amount is how much value you should have on your person at any given time like watches jewelry clothes that kind of stuff cash just don't be carrying that like what's that is it is it was it kanye west who was on like oprah or something and he just pulls out like a wad of cash from his pocket and she's like, how much money do you have on you right now? Or maybe it was some morning show or something. Who knows? But Kanye West is just like, like 25 grand. <laughs> and it's like, Kanye West can do that because he's super rich. I mean, much less richer than he used to be after he became a bit anti-Semitic. <laughs> what happened to Kanye West? I haven't heard about him in ages. People really did just lose interest. As paramedics wheeled Tupac out on a stretcher to be taken to the hospital, he lifted up his arms to give Biggie the finger. He believed that Bad Boy Records had set him up, changing the East Coast rivalry from a potential marketing scheme to an actual blood feud. Tupac received surgery for his wounds, and a few hours after surgery, checked himself out of the hospital against doctor's advice and went to the home of actress Jasmine Guy. What the f***? He got shot five times, and he's checking himself out of the hospital hours later? If I was shot five times, I'd just assume that I'm going to be in the hospital for like six months? <laughs> You know, that's like getting shot five times. It's a long hospital stay. It's not just like, yeah, cool. Thanks for patching me up, guys. Off I go. Somehow able to walk. The two had become friends during his guest appearance on the sitcom A Different World, in which Jasmine starred alongside her friend Jada Pinkett. And he also wanted, is Jada Pinkett like Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith's wife? Is that the same person? Is that really? And he wanted to recover in secret at a house rather than hospital where he could be exposed. The day after the shooting, Bandage Tupac entered a Manhattan courthouse in a wheelchair. The verdict in the Anna Jackson sexual assault case was being read that day. He was acquitted on the counts of sodomy and firearms possession, but found guilty of two counts of first-degree sexual abuse and, I quote, forcibly touching the woman's buttocks in his hotel room. He was released on $25,000 bail pending the sentencing hearing, and who again went to Jasmine's home where he was cared for by his mother and a private doctor, while Black Panthers stood guard as security. A couple of months later, on the 14th of February 1995, it was time for Tupac to be sentenced. We're not going to speculate on whether the jury got it right or wrong, but to reiterate the verdict, Tupac was convicted of grabbing Ayana's ass. Now, I don't condone groping people without their consent, and I'm not claiming that Ayana's story of sexual assault was untruthful, but because that was the decision the jury made, that alone is what the judge should have been obligated to pass sentence on. Instead, what followed could be considered insanity even by America's already insane standards of prison sentencing. Okay, he's being uh, accused, or he's been found guilty, of groping essentially i think groping is wrong i think it's nasty um but i don't think it should particularly attract a prison sentence tupac was sentenced to 18 months to four and a half years in prison obviously the defense was going to appeal this case and in most circumstances a convicted person is allowed to be released from prison on bail while awaiting their appeal to rent this the judge set the bail at three million dollars which tupac's lawyers decried as being inhumane Tupac was sent to Rikers Island before being transferred to Clinton Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison. Bro, why is he in a maximum security prison? He's uh, You have to ignore everything else, the gun possession, all of that stuff, because that's not what he was found guilty of. He was found guilty of groping. Why is he in max? He should be in, like, I don't know what, medium security prison. Maximum security? That's just going to make him a worse criminal. Are you insane? And then one week after the sentencing hearing, Biggie's single Big Popper was released. It was the second single off his debut album from a few months earlier, and it sold over a million copies. However, it was the B-side that caught people's attention with the track Who Shot Yet? Had this song been written about Tupac? Probably not. It was allegedly written before he was shot, and some of the lyrics don't really line up with what happened. But it didn't matter whether the song was about Tupac, because he and many others believed that it was. The Napkin Contract Unable to work and isolated from his vices of weed and alcohol, being in prison gave Tupac time to catch up on reading. Among the books he read were Machiavelli's The Prince and Sun Tzu's The Art of War. 
Jesus, these are heavy books. <laughs> Reigniting his interest in philosophy as well as military strategy. He also married his longtime girlfriend, Keisha Morris, while in prison, though the marriage was annulled shortly after he got out. But before that could happen, he actually had to get out, and the $3 million bail was well beyond his means. To make matters worse, Afini was about to lose her house. Tupac told Keisha to contact Suge Knight, the co founder and CEO of Death Row Records. It's reported that immediately following this, Afini received $15,000, saving her home. This was likely just a gesture of good faith rather than an act of kindness, as there was something Suge was after. He wanted Tupac on Death Row Records. <laughs> Death Row Records, not Death Row. On August the 3rd, Suge was in New York for the second annual Source Awards, and he visited Tupac in prison before heading to the cemetery. At the awards, the rivalry between East and West was on full display. Since the award ceremony was in New York, everybody from Death Row Records was getting booed. A lot of words were being exchanged, including Snoop Dogg's angry tirade against the audience, but nobody that night was more inflammatory than Suge. The award for Best Soundtrack of the Year went to Above the Rim and Dr. Dre, the supervising producer on the album. As an executive producer, Suge went to accept the award on Dre's behalf. In his speech, he stated, Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all the record dancing, come to death row. This was a blatant shot at Puffy, who was notorious for inserting himself into every project that came through Bad Boy Records. A little over a month later, on September the 16th, Suge returned to visit Tupac in prison, and this time he had a deal to offer. Three albums, $3.5 million, and Death Row would use a portion of that money to immediately bond Tupac out of prison. It's referred to as the infamous napkin contract, because the two allegedly worked out the initial deal on a napkin, but it's unclear whether or not this is true. Considering that napkin contract or napkin agreement is a fairly common colloquial term in law, it probably wasn't being used literally here. I'd say that Suge's offer gave Tupac a lot to think about, but it really didn't. At the time, he was signed Interscope and was happy with his deal there, but he had toyed around with the idea of eventually making the move to Death Row anyway. He obviously hadn't decided in favor of it before this, but now his options were either sign with Death Row or stay in prison until his appeal was heard. I have to say, this is a very, very good business move by Suge here, isn't it? It's like, lock him in. You know he's talented. It's like he doesn't have a choice. It's still like, it's a lot of money, though. But for three albums, that's a lot of albums. It had already been eight months since he was locked up, and there's no telling when his appeal would be heard, and so there was nothing really to consider. On October the 4th, Suge returned with a much more formal, though extremely short, contract to sign. I love it when people have short contracts. Because it's just like, it, like I just love a one page. Like you get, I get some ridiculously long contracts. I just looked at one this morning for like something, and it was like two pages long and really simple. And I was like, I love you, whoever wrote this. Your lawyers are champions. Because I've, I've got like 16, 20 page contracts for the most basic sh And I'm like, I'm not reading this. <laughs> what is this? It's just loads of legal nonsense. He put up a $1.4 million bond because I guess when bail is that high, you can't get a bond for only 10% of the total bail like you normally can, or maybe the exorbitant and inappropriate amount of $3 million got reduced slightly. Who knows? The American legal system is weird. Regardless, eight days after signing the contract, Tupac was released from prison and flew back to LA. While he had been in prison, Tupac's third album, Me Against the World, was released. It was written while he was awaiting trial and is considered by many to be his magnum opus. It's described as Tupac facing his inner self with lyrics about paranoia, self-loathing, and depression. The whole album isn't one giant introspective downer, but there's a lot of that. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, and the first signal, Dear Mama, which was a tribute to his mother, was the album's best-selling signal. Yeah, again, I've heard of that. But a few months after being released from prison, his next album, All Eyes on Me, would be released by Death Row. It was rap's first ever double album, and it was markedly different from everything else he'd written. Tupac's music had become much more aggressive. He cast aside nearly all of his social and political commentary, instead filling the double album with nothing but gangster rap and party songs. It also hit number one on the charts and was well received, but critics and fans alike noticed the stark contrast with his other work. When it came time to release singles for the album, there was a treat in store for fans. The album's second single, How Do You Want It, released on June the 4th, 1996. However, it was the B-side that caught everyone's attention. The B-side, Hit Em Up, is considered one of the greatest and probably one of the most vicious diss tracks of all time. Not only does it call out Biggie, Puffy, and other East Coast rappers by name, but he wasted no time in saying to Biggie, you claim to be a player, but I f***ed your wife. <laughs> that wasn't meant as idle trash talk either. Tupac was legitimately claiming to have slept with Biggie's wife, Faith Evans, though she claims to have rejected him when he tried. 
Now, diss tracks and battle raps are a time-honored tradition in rap. They're an extension of a game known as the Dozens, though God only knows why it's called that, which is why there are two participants just insulting each other and possibly their mothers back and forth. It really is a time-honored tradition, too, with the first academic reference to Dozens going back to the 1930s, and origins possibly tracing all the way back to Africa before the Atlantic slave trade. Is this actually relevant, rather than just being a fun fact? Well, sort of. When you have an entire community of people who grew up doing dozens as a routine part of their culture, but suddenly everyone's like, whoa, too bad you went too far. I think that speaks to just how aggressive and over-the-top his rhetoric was becoming. And he went much, much further than just claiming to have slept someone's wife, and we'll come back to that later. <laughs> Holy sh**, okay, T-Bag's getting real. Of course, this track wasn't just your run-of-the-mill East vs. West beef. Tupac truly believed that not only had his shooting been orchestrated, but that he was set up for the sexual assault charges. That wasn't without evidence either, albeit circumstantial. To be clear, what follows is what Tupac believed and is not meant to undermine Ayana's story. Anyway, it all comes back to Haitian Jack. Jack had quite the reputation, mainly for being a dangerous bully. However, there were a lot of rumors and whisperings that he was a snitch. Jack had been charged with the same sexual assault as Tupac, but their cases were tried separately. While Tupac had received up to four and a half years in prison for his conviction, Jack received only probation. Yeah, that seems like more in line with what it should have been. Tupac's lawyers were able to obtain a national rap sheet on Jack, and it was extensive. Sadly, I don't believe the rap sheet is public information, so I can't say for certain how many times he was charged or for what, but lawyers claim the rap sheet showed Jack had been arrested and convicted numerous times all over the country. Yet despite all of these convictions, he'd never done any serious jail time. Based on that information, Tupac and his lawyers felt that Jack was secretly an informant, something that the community already suspected. Yeah, it does seem a bit suspicious, doesn't it? You'd be like, how do you get off so easy, Jack? <laughs> oh, you know, just uh, just good lawyers. <laughs> right, yeah. Compared to your good lawyers, you got you four and a half years. While Jack did manage to avoid jail for a suspiciously long time, it didn't last forever. In 2004, he was convicted of a shooting in an LA nightclub, resulting in prison time and his deportation back to Haiti in 2007. Of course, that eventual outcome doesn't really strengthen either case. It could be that he was just really lucky and had great lawyers for a lot of his life, or if he was really informed but stopped being protected once he was burned as an asset. All I can say for certain is what Tupac believed to have been true. And since Puffy, Biggie, and other rappers from Bad Boy were at the studio when he was shot, he believed they were involved in the attempted takedown as well. But Tupac's final year wasn't all doom and gloom. He also made the unlikeliest of friends. He was out at a party and saw Rashida Jones, who began following her around, saying that he wanted to apologize and respond to her letter. Wait, what letter? At least that's what he thought was happening, but the girl kept ignoring him, seemingly unaware of what he was talking about. Eventually, she realized that Tupac thought she was Rashinda, but he actually had been following around her sister, Kidada Jones. Once that was cleared up, the two started talking and immediately hit it off and began dating in 1996, eventually getting engaged. Her half-brother, Quincy Delight Jones III, or QD3, even started producing some of Tupac's songs. Among the projects QD3 helped produce was Tupac's first posthumously released album, Don Caluminati, The Seven Day Theory. It was recorded under the stage name of Machiavelli, and it was intended to be released as a sort of underground mixtape rather than through standard distribution channels. The title, The Seven Day Theory, comes from the fact that the entire album was produced in seven days. Three days were spent writing and recording 21 songs, 12 of which made the final cut, with four additional days for mixing. Compared to All Eyes on Me, which Tupac described as being a celebration of life, this album was much darker in tone. It was recorded in the first week of August, one month before his death, and they were some of the last songs that he'd ever record. But at least he was prepared for what was about to happen. According to friends of Tupac, he had an obsession with death. He had seemed genuinely surprised to have survived to 21, and he was always making plans for after he was gone. Shock G recalled how Tupac was always preparing. If I die this way, put this out. If I die that way, I want you to put this out. He wanted to cover all of those bases. He also gave the books full of poetry he wrote to Layla, telling her to hold on to them so that when he died, she could share that side of him with the world. While this part may have been unrelated to his assumption he would die, after being released from prison, he purchased his mother a house and set up recurring payments so that she'd receive $16,000 per month for herself and her family, payments that would continue even after he died. But with everything else out of the way, that brings us to the events of 7th of September 1996, $16,000 per month in the 90s. I mean, that's a lot of money today, but in the 90s? Good lord. The Murder of Tupac Tupac was in Las Vegas with Suge Knight and other members of their entourage in September for the upcoming WBA championship title bout between Bruce Seldon and Mike Tyson. Tyson and Tupac were friends, and Iron Mike had personally invited Tupac and his crew to come and see the fight. Since being released from prison a few months before Tupac was, though they weren't housed at the same prison, Tyson had won the WBC 
which I now realize is World Boxing Championship, a heavyweight title and was now challenging Selden for the WBA heavyweight belt. WBA, World Boxing Association, maybe? Who knows? I don't follow boxing. However, the match itself was more than a little disappointing to many of those in attendance. Tyson came out swinging, and in a little over a minute, he knocked Selden to the match for an eight-count. Selden got up, but Tyson immediately knocked him back down. This time, while Selden was able to get back to his feet, he couldn't maintain his balance. The ref called the fight, and Tyson was declared the winner by TKO after only 109 seconds. It was one of the shortest title matches in boxing history, and the arena was immediately filled with chance of fix by Angle boxing fans claiming that Selden had taken a dive. I'm not entirely sure why they would assume the match was rigged since Tyson had a career of 22 first round knockouts and this match wasn't even close to cracking his top 10 fastest knockouts. They're just disappointed. They pay like uh, boxing. I can't believe how much like pay-per-view boxing costs. Well, I don't know. The only sport that I occasionally watch is tennis and you can watch it for free on the BBC or like for very low cost on whatever your sports package of choice is. And then it's like a boxing thing. It'll be like $100 just to watch a, watch a match. And that's on TV. It must be very expensive to go and see it in person. And then if it's over in a minute and a half, you're like, what the f***? Guess how disappointed they would be spending all of their money just to see a fight that was over before they even had a chance to get drunk. Yes, agreed. After the main event, there was another unscheduled fight that took place in the lobby of the MGM Grand where the boxing match had taken place. Among those with Tupac that night was Trevon Lane, friend of Shogun Tupac and an employee of Death Row Records, though the closest thing to a job title I can find for him is Homeboy Security. A couple of months earlier, he'd been at Lakewood Mall when he was jumped by a group of Southside Crips. Trevon was a member of the Mob Piru Blood, so Theoretically, this could have been a bit of random violence among rival gangs, but an unprovoked attack inside a mall seems a bit weird. It's believed that there was a much more specific motive at play. People associated with Death Row Records had all been given chains by Suge with a big Death Row medallion on it. It's alleged that Puffy had put out a bounty with the Crips of $10,000 per medallion they stole because he wanted to show them off in an upcoming music video to taunt Suge. That day at the mall, they'd succeeded in stealing Trevon's medallion. Jumping back to the MGM after the Tyson fight, Trevon spotted Orlando Anderson walking alone through the lobby. He whispered to Tupac that Orlando was the guy that stole his chain, and Tupac ran over, followed by the rest of the group. Security footage from the hotel shows Tupac throwing the first punch, with the others from Death Row punching and kicking Orlando on the ground. The whole thing lasts about seven or eight seconds, and Orlando wasn't seriously injured. Afterwards, they returned to their hotel rooms to get ready to head out to Club 662, a venue owned by Suge, where Tupac was going to be putting on a charity concert to raise money for a youth boxing program. Kadada had traveled to Vegas with Tupac and his cousin Jamala, but he had insisted that they stay back at the hotel instead of coming to the fight. As they got ready to leave, he told them again to stay behind, claiming that the party was just for the boys. However, he also told them not to leave the hotel room, not even go to the lobby. Why? Is he he's worried about them? Why is he worried about them? I mean, are people really going to go after his family? That seems a bit intense. This seemed to indicate that he was concerned for their safety, but his other behavior indicated that he wasn't concerned about his own, that or he had resigned himself to his fate. Tupac had a bulletproof vest that he normally wore, but as he got ready to head to Club 662, he said he wasn't going to wear it because it would be too hot. Kadada and Jamala begged him to wear the vest, especially with how he was acting towards them, but he refused. When it was time to get into the cars, Tupac got in the passenger seat of Suge's BMW. His bodyguard, Frank Alexander, an ex-Marine and bodybuilder, went to get in the car with them as he normally would, but Tupac told him to ride in the car behind them. They began their drive to the club, when a car pulled up beside them at a red light on Harmon Avenue. The driver yelled, Yo, what up, Pac? After a moment, Tupac recognized him as Leonard Jefferson, a UCLA film student with whom he had a passing acquaintance. Tupac invited him to the club for the show, and Leonard, who happened to have a camera in his center console, asked to take a picture quickly. As the light was turning green, Leonard took the famous last photo of Tupac sitting in the car next to Shug. That's Leonard's story anyway, though there are people that dispute his authorship of the photo. Regardless, this photo has been subject of a lot of speculation and conspiracy theorizing because of its somewhat eerie qualities. In the picture, Tupac's face is expressionless, completely devoid of emotion. Many, including Leela, saw the photo and immediately believed that he knew his life was about to come to an end. And then there's Suge, who looked like a man on a mission. Because there were conspiracies that he was involved in orchestrating Tupac's murder, this photo and Suge's appearance were often pointed out as evidence that he was somehow taking part in what was about to happen. That's not evidence. That's like just wild theorizing. It's like, why do you think he's guilty murder? He looks like a murderer, doesn't he? Of course, it could be that Suge was actually just a man on a mission, and that mission was to try and get to his club for a concert while dealing with the obnoxious post-fight traffic. I'd look pretty annoyed in that situation too. Yeah, if every time I'm looking annoyed because I'm driving, it's not because I'm about to murder someone, it's because I'm really bothered by traffic or bad drivers. 
I was driving somewhere the other day and I stop for people at a crosswalk and the guy behind me beeps me. And I'm like, it's a fucking crosswalk. What do you want? In any event, moments after the picture was taken, a white Cadillac pulled up beside Suge's BMW at another light. Somebody from the Cadillac opened fire, grazing Suge's head and hitting Tupac four times in the chest, arms, and thighs. The Cadillac then sped off, while Suge made a U-turn and tried to speed off in the opposite direction, with the Lexus driven by Frank Alexander following suit. The tires on the BMW had been shot, so it didn't get very far before pulling over, leading to the scene with a police officer that I described at the beginning of the episode. Tupac was rushed to the hospital where he was heavily sedated and fell into a coma. The damage was so severe that they had to remove one of his lungs, and after six days he finally succumbed to his wounds and was pronounced dead. Oh my god. For a long time, little else was publicly known about this incident. Witnesses were uncooperative to the frustration of police. While Tupac was still in critical condition in the hospital, police sergeant Kevin Manning lamented, It amazes me when they are professional bodyguards that they can't even give us an accurate description of the vehicle. Since nothing was being shared openly about the case, all sorts of theories and speculation resulted. Was Tupac set up by Puffy, by Shug, by Stretch? Was he killed by the government? Was he alive and well in Cuba? The police had a long list of suspects, and while they went decades without making an arrest, they weren't able to rule out any of their suspects either. Nobody was going to talk, so even though there were plenty of people that knew what had happened that night, it seemed like the case would remain unsolved forever. Luckily, this episode doesn't have to be filled with a bunch of insane conspiracy theories that barely seem plausible, because an arrest has finally been made. An arrest that had been a long time coming and didn't really shock anybody. Of course, you're probably a little confused, Simon, since Kathy D hasn't actually appeared in this episode beside the introduction. At this point, I should probably mention that not only was Kathy D a high-ranking shot caller within the South Compton Crips, he was also Orlando Anderson's uncle. Wait, who was Orlando Anderson? Oh, the guy who stole the, med stole the medallion. Okay. So he got murdered for going up to a guy that stole his medallion. He got killed by his uncle or something. Really? Kevy D tells all. In 2006, a now retired LAPD homicide detective, Greg Cading, was assigned to the cold case of Biggie. There were rumors that the murders of Tupac and Biggie were connected, and not just the suspicion that one was retaliation for the other. It was while investigating ties between the two murders that Kading stumbled upon Kefi D. Kading spent three years building a massive federal case against Kefi. Kefi was a big-time drug dealer moving large quantities of cocaine for the Colombians, as well as trafficking in PCP. Narcotics are bad, and it's good to try and prevent their distribution and whatnot, but that wasn't actually the point of any of Kading's investigation. He was building this case as leverage to get Keefe to talk about the murders of Tupac and Biggie. In 2009, Kading offered a proffer agreement, also known as Queen for a Day. I have no idea what that is or what that means. The way a proffer agreement works, excellent, we're getting an explanation, is that a potential suspect agrees to discuss details of a case, including incriminating details in an informal interview, and anything they say cannot be used against them. Basically, you have one day to tell the investigators everything without any of it being admissible as evidence, so you'd better tell them absolutely everything. It was being offered in this case because it was believed that Keefe was involved in Tupac's murder, but that he was not the one who pulled the trigger. This meant they could potentially use him to identify the gunman. Well, what's the... Oh, okay, so they're building a case against him for something else, and then they're like, yo, if you testify, we'll give you this immunity, basically. However, there are a couple of caveats to a proffer agreement, and ones that Keefe does not seem to have understood properly. First, while nothing you say can be used as evidence, it can be used to derive and obtain other evidence. As I understand it, this means that if I were to say in a proffer section, I killed Joey Jojo and buried him at 123 Fake Street, they cannot use that confession as evidence. However, if they go to 123 Fake Street, dig up Joey Jojo's body, and there's a knife in his chest covered in my fingerprints and DNA, well, that gets to be used as evidence. Um, okay, so that seems incredibly risky to be in involved in this, and you should absolutely have a team of expensive lawyers with you. Absolutely. 100%. At present, we don't know if there's any evidence that has been found related to Tupac's murder, though there's a pretty strong chance that there has been. A couple of months before his arrest, a search warrant was issued for Keefe's home. This wasn't a typical warrant where a car pulls up and the police knock on the door either. This was multiple police cars, lights flashing, dude on a megaphone demanding that they exit the house unarmed. For the search warrant to be executed in such a fashion, there's a strong likelihood that new concrete evidence has been discovered. That aside, it's the other caveat to the proffer agreement that is much more likely to have gotten Keefe in trouble. You see, nothing you say in a proffer session can be used against you, but it's not actually an offer of immunity. That's why it's so important to give every detail you can so there's nothing left for police to discover that could be considered derivative evidence from your statements. Oh, okay, so if you're like Joey Jojo was murdered at 123 Fake Street with a knife that I put in his chest, <laughs> you've got to be so specific. You've got to cover all of your bases, and that's what lawyers are very good at. 
Keefe published a memoir, Compton Street Legends, in which he detailed the night of Tupac's murder. He also sat down for like six hours of interviews with DJ Vlad, in which he told the story again. This isn't necessarily enough to make the public statements admissible as evidence, and it depends on the wording of the proffer letter, among other things. However, if anything Keefe wrote in his memoir or said to DJ Vlad is materially different than what he told the police, those latter statements are absolutely admissible. And since there were discrepancies in Keefe's statements between the two public sources I mentioned, I'd wager there are discrepancies between those accounts and his official statement as well. Oh my lord, you have to be incredibly careful with proffer agreements. Because you'd just be like, oh yeah, immunity for anything that I admit to, let's go. But the reality is you have to be extremely careful. Oh my God, lesson learned. If the police are ever like, yo, whistle, you got a proffer, you queen for a day. I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> lawyers, get lawyers in here. So what actually happens and why? Keep in mind, everything that follows is from Keefe's own accounts of what happens. So while self-incriminating as his statements may be, they're all currently just allegations. According to Keefe, Puffy put a hit out on Suge Knight and Tupac for a million dollars each. A friendly rivalry was one thing, but Tupac was out of control. In Hit 'em Up, Tupac threatened to murder East Coast rappers' children before they even grew up, and Puffy was worried for his safety. The offer was made over the course of three different conversations, uh, again, just to highlight, allegedly, and Keefe said they'd take care of it because that's what they do. But on the night in question, killing them wasn't actually the plan. At least that's what Keefe claims, though some of the details are a bit contradictory. After Orlando got assaulted, Keefe wanted to talk to Suge, though he described the assault as largely being whatever. Orlando and his crew had jumped Trev on, stolen his chain, so they got Orlando back for it. Neither of them were seriously hurt, so it didn't need to be a big deal. Keefe said that it wasn't even a Bloods vs. Crips thing since Tupac threw the first punch and he wasn't a member of either gang. DJ Vlad pressed him on the topic since Suge was heavily associated associated with the mob Piru Bloods, and both he and Trevon took part in the assault, but Keefe stood firm and said that it had nothing to do with what happens. Even though he felt the assault against his nephew didn't need to become a whole thing, Keefe still wanted to talk to Suge personally to handle it. He felt that the relationship was on the level where they could just talk it out and make sure the situation dissipated instead of escalating, so they headed to Club 662, where they knew there was going to be a concert that night. At least, that was his original intent. But another opportunity presented itself. Before they took off for the club, Keefe got called over to Eric Von Zip Martin's Bentley. Zip was hanging out with rapper Foxy Brown at the time, so he asked her to get out of the car, and Keefe got in to talk. Zip was a fellow drug dealer who bounced between the east and west coasts, and he was Puffy's usual go-between for dealing with the Crips. Once Keefe was in the car, Zip opened up a secret compartment, pulled out a Glock 40, and told Keefe, it's time to get paid. Keefe got into the passenger seat of the white Cadillac, with Terrence Bubble Up Brown driving and Orlando in the back seat, along with DeAndre Freaky Smith. Oh, once in the car, he tossed the Glock into the back seat and they headed to the club. They got there and they waited outside for 30 or 40 minutes. While there, the Cadillac and its occupants were spotted by Mob James McDonald, head of Death Row's street security. He did not approach the car, they did not see him, and he apparently didn't remember any of this when there were police were trying to find leads, but he confirmed in a 2019 interview that he did in fact see them at 6.62 that night, providing partial corroboration for Keefe's story. After waiting for a while at the club without Suge and Tupac showing up, Keefe decided to cool things off. They could just go buy some champagne and spend the night drinking and smoking weed and said, If it is ever put out on me, I hope that my assassins are equally impatient. Yes. Agreed. It's like, what should we do? Should we, should we do our job or should we just go get drunk? They started driving away and turned a corner when they heard a couple of girls yelling, Tupac! Tupac! It's possible they would have kept on driving had they not seen Tupac hanging out the window of Suge's BMW, presumably inviting the girls to the club. They made a U-turn and followed the car, eventually pulling up next to it at a red light. Once the cars were side by side, the men looked at one another. Keefe said that Tupac made an erratic movement, like he was reaching under his seat to pull out a gun. That's when Orlando grabbed his gun and opened fire. Death Row rappers from the car directly behind Tupac and Shug then began returning fire before the Cadillac drove away. It varies in Keefe's various recounting of events how explicitly he implicates his nephew as the shooter, but he's run his mouth enough times to make it clear that that is his version of events. And after all, he didn't even get paid. Not because Puffy wasn't going to keep his end of the bargain, but because Zip took the payment and ran off with it instead of paying Keefe. But this brings us back to the question from the beginning of the episode. Why now? A lot of this information was new to me when researching this case, and is likely new to you as well. But most of it has been widely available to anybody that actively sought it out for over a decade. Even before that, there were plenty of people who knew the real story, so why wasn't anyone willing to talk even when silence meant protecting their enemies? 
Well, it was pretty easy to say why nobody wanted to come forward initially. From the more cynical point of view, there would of course be the fear that being labeled a snitch and all of the repercussions that can arise from that, as well as concerns about drawing attention to any of their own potentially illegal activities. That all likely played a part in it. However, if a part of my everyday life was the knowledge that I might arbitrarily get my sh** kicked in because a couple of cops didn't think my name was American enough, I'd probably be pretty uncooperative with the police as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's like the, the guy's last words were f**k you to the police. So you can't imagine that many of the people around this are like, oh yeah, no, I'll talk to the police. <laughs> That gives a reasonable enough explanation for why nobody else ever spoke up on the matter. So what made Keefe come forward? He told his story as part of the proffer agreement in 2009, but he could have left it there. In fact, he did leave it there, and that might have been the end of it. So why implicate himself and his nephew in the murder? Well, when Keefe started first telling his story publicly in 2018, he was 55 years old and been diagnosed with colon cancer, the same form of cancer that claimed the lives of his mother and one of his brothers. As for Orlando, he was shot and killed at a car wash back in 1998 over a disagreement involving drug money. Bubble Up was also killed in a 2015 shooting, and DeAndre died from diabetes in 2004. Keefe was the only one from the car left, and he essentially had nothing to lose by telling the truth. He also claimed to feel remorse over what happened, so he wanted to get the real story out. Yeah, these are the things, like, when these murders came, you know, this was like, it would be a mystery forever. And then it's like, later on, you get, like, basic what are deathbed confessions. And it's like, a few times they come up in the casual criminal, it's like, yeah, we'll never know about this one. Until, like, maybe 20, 30 years, when someone comes out of the woodwork, and they're about to die, and they're like, yeah, yeah, this is what happens. And you're like, ah, oh, resolution. Despite not being the one to pull the trigger, California law, and the law in most states, still allows Keefe to be charged with first-degree murder, the charge upon which he was indicted. According to Chief Deputy District Attorney Mark De Giacomo, Keefe was the on-ground on-site commander who ordered the death of Tupac. A grand jury had been reviewing evidence for months before the arrest, and the indictment was announced just hours after Keefe was brought in. At the time of writing, Keefe's arraignment has been delayed, so he hasn't yet entered a plea, but he is expected to plead not guilty. You'll know whether or not that's the case by the time this episode releases, but unless he shocks everyone by pleading guilty, we will still not know the outcome of the trial yet. I mean, we can certainly guess what the outcome will be, because if Keefe's story is to be believed, then one could argue he has incriminated himself beyond a reasonable doubt, but juries make inexplicable decisions sometimes. Aftermath this was not the first murder attributed to the East-West rivalry. It would not be the last six months after Tupac was killed. Biggie was also killed in a drive-by shooting, this time in Los Angeles. The complete story of the feud and to what extent it may have been overblown is a complicated and nuanced tale for another day, but public perception was and largely is that Tupac's murder was part of the culmination of that feud. And if Keefe's allegations that Puff Daddy ordered the murder are true, then it would certainly lend credence to that belief. Oh my god, beefs in the rap community are intense. <laughs> like with YouTube people, you're always like, oh, this guy's got a beef with that guy or whatever. And it's always just over some like nonsense or it's a little bit harmless. Or even if it isn't harmless, it's like they're not shooting each other. Like all of us, Tupac was far from a perfect person. However, his body of work speaks for itself. Not only is he regarded as one of the most influential rappers, but he's often cited as one of the most influential musicians of all time. And despite being killed at 25 while in the prime of his career, his large body of posthumously released work has allowed him to remain in the top 10 best-selling rappers of all time though just barely by this point. I could try to tell you about the meaning of his songs and poetry, and I feel a bit bad that there hasn't been much discussion of his music in this episode, but there have been entire college courses taught about Tupac's words, so nothing I could fit in the confines of a true crime show could possibly do it justice. However, there is another side to Tupac that's often overlooked, which is his philanthropy. The reason this isn't talked about much is because Tupac didn't talk about it. He felt that doing so would take away from what he was doing. In all honesty, we'll probably never know the full extent of what he did to help people since he didn't broadcast it, but over the years he held benefit concerts and reportedly donated millions of dollars to help poor and underprivileged children, especially those who came from parents battling substance abuse. I like that a great deal. Not just the giving, but just the quiet, like, just quietly giving. I like that. But life is all about the little things, and that is where he excelled. One story that was later shared took place when he was in Washington, D.C. for a stop on a promotional tour. On the way to the airport to fly back to New York, there was a story on the radio about a young girl that had been taken to the emergency room after being mauled by a pit bull. Tupac ordered the driver to turn the car around to go to the hospital. He found the girl's parents in the waiting room and told them that he was there to lend his support. He wound up staying with the girl's family until she made a full recovery, and his friends claimed that he maintained a friendship with the family for the rest of his life. That's got to be a bit weird, though. Like... If I was in that situation and my kid was like, Sean, whatever, I'd be like, but, okay, really appreciate it, Tupac, but this is kind of like a family thing. <laughs> oh, I don't know, is that bad? 
I mean, unless you're going to pay for the hospital bills, this is America or whatever. Oh, maybe he's out. I don't know. But he's just being nice. Why am I shitting on him? This is just a nice thing to do. While we know this story and a few others, because his friends or the people involved have shared them, Tupac never sought media attention for these acts. He did these things quietly because he cared about helping people, and he didn't want those people to think he was just doing it for media attention or to sell albums. We never know how many lives that he touched personally like this. It's important to remember these underreported acts of kindness, just as it's important to appreciate the value of his work. But it's also important not to ignore his crimes and his acts of violence as well. A person is more than just one thing, and we can't cherry-pick who we want them to be. To that end, I'll leave you with Tupac's own words. Measure a man by his actions, fully, from the beginning to the end. Don't take a piece out of my life or a song out of my music and say this is what I'm about. Because you know better than that. Dismembered Appendices Number 1. Don Caluminati, the Seven Day Theory, was not the intended name for the album. It was originally to be called the Three Day Theory, since it would be written and recorded in three days. But even after the number was changed, it was supposed to be Caluminati, the Seven Day Theory, by Machiavelli the Don. Death Row Records accidentally screwed up the title and the artist's name in their rush to bring the album to publication following Tupac's death, which I'm sure was definitely done to honor his memory and not as a shameless cash grab. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, that's definitely what it was. Number two. Because of Tupac's obsession with planning for his own death, there are many that believe he was a prophet or held psychic abilities. <laughs> those people are incorrect because psychic abilities don't exist. One of those pieces of evidence that was used to argue this case was the song God Bless the Dead, which was released after Biggie's death. The song opens with the line, Rest in peace to my mother Biggie Smalls, and is dedicated to celebrating the passing of his fallen friend. But since Tupac was killed before Biggie was, how could he have known to write this song dedicated to Biggie's memory if he wasn't psychic? Well, because he knows at some point Biggie's gonna die. <laughs> it's like, you know, one thing we know with certainty, everyone's gonna die. This was actually a mystery for a long time, but we now have a definitive answer that doesn't involve anyone having magic powers. When Tupac wrote God Bless the Dead, it wasn't actually about the notorious B.I.G. It was about a graffiti artist he met in his career who also happened to go by Biggie Smalls. Oh, there we go, even simpler explanation. Tupac even knew a third person called Biggie Smalls, because that's just the name that was given to everyone who shopped in the big and tall section, I guess. It's just like how there's been a million short guys named Stretch and bald guys named Curly. <laughs> and never, no one's ever called me Curly. Hey, like Curly. It's like, oh, I get it because I'm bald. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on the podcast, if you're watching on Spotify, if you're listening on Spotify, why not leave a rating? It's always greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time.